So Carissa, firstly, could you share a little bit more about your role in your career journey to get there? You bet, as you, as sorry. <laughs> no worries. I'm moving around to get better lighting. I'm in a hotel room, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> really happy to be here with you all. And um, so I've had probably a very eclectic journey uh, to get where I am today. Uh, I grew up in Idaho in a very small town and uh, ended up going to Harvard and getting a, a PhD in international political economy. And from there went into strategy consulting. And then from there ended up um, using my Spanish language skills to work for the largest advertiser in the US Hispanic market for about a decade. And there is really where I got um, a true business education, I would say, being in charge of everything from strategy to marketing, to business development, to product development, et cetera. And that really galvanized me and my experience, the importance of understanding your customer, right? Of all aspects of the customer. And so, you know, as a Latina myself and serving the US Hispanic market and then the entire Spanish speaking world market, an important part of our strategy was to understand the varied customer needs and then design products and services that could help uh, meet those needs. And I think that experience over a decade, we introduced eight to nine new products and services over that same time period, really helped me to understand the importance of that approach. And at Walmart, you know, I get a chance to do that. I went and left that company and did my own startup. So as I said, eclectic path, um, raised money. It was in the healthcare space, which is how I got into healthcare. Um, and so now I've spent about half my career in healthcare and the other half in consumer products and services. And Walmart is just the perfect sort of culmination of those two sets of, of experiences because I get to actually bring consumer marketing to healthcare, which was always sort of my passion of, as I used to say you know, to people in healthcare, Dr. and Gamble spends hundreds of millions of dollars to understand how to develop the right laundry detergent with the right scent and the right packaging at the right price point. And yet we treat every person living with diabetes exactly the same. Like surely we can do better. And so, you know, when uh, a former colleague reached out about the opportunity at Walmart, you know, I jumped at it because as a platform for truly having a positive impact on the US healthcare system, there is no greater platform than Walmart. 150 million people walk through our doors every day. We are where they get their groceries. We are where they get um, their exercise equipment and clothing, et cetera. And that opportunity to use that platform to nudge people into living their healthiest lives, it just thrills me. It was like, yes, sign me up. I will go to Walmart. And it's been really fun to be back on a consumer marketing uh, floor with people who are using the best practices in terms of marketing to try to influence people, not just on the laundry detergent that they buy, but on all aspects of our daily lives and particularly to use that to promote wellness in the US is just super exciting. So that's my eclectic path to Walmart and why I love so much what I do today. I love that, Carissa. It's an impressive career path so far. I absolutely feel that energy already. I'm already like, I'm already pumped up and it sounds like it's a, it's a dream job. As a Latina, at a company based in the South, do you feel you bring a unique perspective? Oh, absolutely. And particularly because I'm a US born Latina, uh, you know, not all Latinas have an accent. And I think that that in the South is like hard to compute. Like they can understand people who have an accent, okay, that those can be Hispanic, but what do you mean like you're Latina? And, you know, in some ways it's very um, startling when people, I share that with people of like, yes, I do speak Spanish. Yes, I am a Latina. Just because you can't tell doesn't mean that that's not so. And so I think there's that sacred role or function, if you will. And then the other is just to remind people of we all live in our bubbles. And the Hispanic market in the US is extremely varied by country of origin, by native born, not native born, et cetera. And yet, if you look at our demographics as a customer base, Hispanics make up the probably the largest, most loyal customers that we have at Walmart. And so it is bringing that understanding and those questions to why are we doing what we're doing? How are we thinking about our processes internally to make sure that diversity and inclusion isn't just about numbers on a page, but how we do business. And I remember, you know, again, one of the first calls I had with the recruiter, um, the person that was recruiting me in said, you know, we have managed to be the only company who hires non-Spanish speaking pharmacists in Miami. I don't even know how you do that. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> speaking pharmacist in Miami, but we did it 
right? <laughs> With no thought to, hey, this is a heavily Spanish dominant market. Perhaps we should recruit for people who can actually look like, sound like, and relate to our customers in this market. So I think that is you know, sort of the sacred function I bring along with people like Carol and uh, many others who are very committed to diversity and inclusion at Walmart and actually representing that on a daily basis and how we approach the business problems we're trying to solve. I love that, um, Carissa, thank you. I mean, I talk a lot about how we should be helping our clients create more personalized and relevant commerce experiences, right? And to stop thinking of these homogenous groups of people, to your point, Carissa, but actually how do you truly understand them? How do you really show up authentically? So let's hold that thought because we're going to unpack, unpack that a little bit in a moment. Carol, um, welcome also to you. You and I have had um, a, a chance to connect already, but for you know the benefit of our audience, I'd love for you to talk a bit about yourself, your passion and kind of your career pathway. Yeah, sure. And I'm reminded constantly that how lucky I am. My journey took me to people like Carissa. We have so many smart, passionate leaders like her on the Walmart team that I just feel really lucky to be here. But uh, I finished my MBA uh, at, in St. Louis and came to Walmart to work just after that. I spent about five years in category marketing. And as a previous cultural anthropologist, it was a really neat experience to work on categories like fishing and hunting and automotive hardware, things that I knew zero about, and really dig into the data and understand that consumer um, kind of the same way that I had learned about different cultural groups. So that was fantastic experience. Uh, went over to product development and private brand strategy at Walmart for a year uh, to really hone my uh, supply chain side that I also, again, it was a gap for me. Um, I then moved to uh, CPG at Del Monte Foods and spent three years there, first in shopper marketing and then did sales. Sales was something I never, ever, ever thought I was going to do, but it was a really interesting experience to see the other side, how I would use the marketing data and storytelling um, and apply it to sales. Learned a ton, um, but along the way kept realizing that DEI truly was my passion. I started their first um, ERG, um, was a founding member of the Diversity Leadership Council there, and um, just felt that pull in my heart that whether it was marketing or DEI, I knew, I knew I had to make a change. And so I started, similar to Carissa, but probably not nearly as successfully, started a business on the side um, doing diversity uh, recruiting consulting. Loved that, but wanted to spend every minute of every day focused on DEI and the stars sort of just aligned for me at the, for this job back at Walmart where I am focused 100% on DEI. Uh, whatever it is, whether there's a project, a task, a, a need, um, an issue, um, if I can be a DEI advocate, advisor, resource connector, whatever it is, um, that's kind of my role. So I get to wear a lot of different hats, but focused on um, our DEI journey all the time. So really happy to be here and to share it with you. I love that, Carolyn. Honestly, both of you, the breadth and depth of both of your experiences is really phenomenal and really impressive. Um, we could probably spend the next 20 minutes just talking about that. Uh, but what I wanted to do is kind of move the conversation on a little bit and talk about kind of that consumer, talk about how Walmart is finding new ways to, to connect with, with consumers. Carissa, can you talk about how you, how Walmart thinks about speaking to the multicultural customer and how's that, how's that changed within your business? Sure, it is constantly uh, changing, Debbie. I would say part one is grounding in who is our customer. And that varies, you know, because we have 4,700 stores across the US, the answer isn't always the same, but really taking that nuanced approach to understand who is the customer and how do we connect with them? How do we actually bring to life being what I like to coin the center of well-being for every community we serve? And it serves as a North Star, both in the literal sense of understanding the actual communities where our stores are, but also the communities that we want to serve across the country. And I think that piece of the diversity inclusion puzzle rests on understanding who is the target customer. And then how do we show up? How do we understand their wants and needs and design the experiences, the products, the services that actually help them live their best lives? And I think 
you know, I've learned so much about Walmart since I've been with Walmart over the last two years that I didn't know on the outside as a customer. Like all the great things that Walmart does every day to connect with customers that basically haven't been told as a story, right? Haven't been known to the outside. But if you look at those communities, it's what our people and our associates are doing every day on, on the store level. And so really finding those opportunities of best practices to spread out there. So some of the things, you know, one of the things in my health and wellness portfolio that we've done for about four, almost five years now is something called wellness days. And we do it once a quarter, so four times a year in every store across the fleet where we have free wellness screenings for our, our customers, our consumers. And we do everything from glucose testing to BMI to vision, you name it, and then give them the results. And again, this has been a service to the community. It's an opportunity for our pharmacists to come out from behind their counters and actually you know, talk and, and connect with people one-on-one. -on -one. But it's been amazing in terms of the value of helping, again, my personal passion of nudging people to their best selves is because you don't know what you don't know. If you don't go for a regular doctor checkup, if you don't go for a, a physical annually, you don't actually know what could be going wrong with you or what you should be paying attention to. And so it really does help sort of connect with customers that this isn't just a place where I buy things. This is a place where I can actually have the help I might need as an individual, as a family, as a community to live my best life. And particularly in rural America right now, there is a crisis in healthcare. There is a crisis in, in access to just everyday primary care. And so it's one of those ways that we use our platform to connect with our customers in the most primal essential way, right? Um, and it's now the strategy is how do we take that and make it even more personalized, right? So Debbie's needs in terms of wellness and thinking about wellness aren't the same as Carol's, aren't the same as mine, aren't the same as my mother's or my, you know, a millennial, et cetera. And understanding how do we turn up in those communities in slightly different ways. So if it's an older customer, what are their health screenings and conversations like versus a younger customer who might not have the same you know, exposure to chronic disease at this point in their life, but is just looking to get back into shape, right? And so taking a nuanced customer-based view onto it first and foremost, to then put those programs out together to be a more personalized approach versus just a one-size-fits-all across America. Uh, and I mean, it's just, I, I just really astounded and so impressed by some of those programs and initiatives, Carissa, and it probably will seem like a silly question, but I want to ask from your perspective, why is it so important for Walmart to create those more relevant personalized commerce experiences? Why, you know, why are we trying to get to almost that one-to-one -one connection um, with the people in, in the community? I think it goes back to what is our mission. You know, when Mr. Sam created Walmart, it really was not just a tagline of save money, live better. It was a mantra. And if you go and spend time in Walmart uh, headquarters in Bentonville and throughout the, the company, people really internalize that of my mission in life, no matter what my role in Walmart is, is to help my customers save money and live better. And I think over the last few years, that second part of it of live better how we bring that to life is why we seek those personal connections, why we seek that emotional connection of, are we doing everything we can to use the platform to help our customers and our communities live better? And as we have all lived and breathed, especially over this last year and a half through COVID, right? That connection of community is more important than ever. Like being able to be a place where you can go get organic produce, even in the middle of rural Wyoming, at a price that you can afford and to feed your family, being a place where you can get COVID testing or COVID vaccination or a variety of things that we do every day in our centers. Like there's the commerce part of that, but there's also the personal part of that of do I trust this retailer? Do I trust this organization to be there truly as an authentic part of my community or not just someone who's trying to sell me something? And I think that's the great legacy I'd say of, of Sam Walton is really taking to heart, living those values every day of our merchants work hard to, to source the products at a price that is competitive and we do do that. But that second piece is equally important of how do we turn up to help our customers live their best lives, no matter who you are, no matter where you are in the US. Absolutely, and that positive impact that you are playing to help people better their lives, help communities kind of 
better, um, be much more informed and going just before beyond product, Carissa, and into, into services, I think is, is, is really phenomenal. And connecting that in terms of how you reach those consumers, how you reach those communities, of course, there's a role for, for marketing to play, a, to play a role in that, right? And, and Carol, I wanted to explore with you the role of DE&I within marketing over in Walmart. And, and you've, re you've recently added a dedicated DE&I headcount in marketing. Can you explain to us kind of why that was important to do? Yeah, sure. It is so important. As we all know, there are so many DEI advocates like the three of us that end up doing DEI on the side. It's a volunteer you know, obligation really, um, but it's a side job for so many. And as the work gets really busy as it does, um, then any of those side jobs kind of drop off. And so it's really exciting that Walmart has made this a dedicated role because it is my job all day, every day. And so it's never going to fall off as a side job. And for us, um, you know, we're putting out so much creative on a daily basis, on an annual basis, um, that we need the extra attention to it. And so we do a lot of different things um, to ensure that we're doing the right thing. And, you know, that message of living better um, comes through and is trusted, especially when our cust customers see themselves in our work. And so we have a lot of systems and processes and, um, I guess, strategies in place to, to bring that to life. One of the things we do is we have a creative review board. Again, it's a team of volunteers, so um, it is second to their day job, but um, it's something they're passionate about. And they review all of our work. It's a diverse group of associates. Um, and they're looking at all of our work, every single piece of creative um, to determine, is it representative, both of our customer base, but also our associate base. And when we do represent our customers, are we doing it in an authentic way? Um, are we uh, being culturally sensitive? Are we putting uh, diverse characters in uh, positions of power in the creative? And so um, that has been really impactful. And I don't think we could um, make that happen if we didn't have this dedicated resource on a day-to-day -day basis. I really like the sound of that. And it's definitely something that we've been talking about here over at BMLY and our commerce is how can we ask intentionally those questions of ourselves and of the work that we produce and and I think it's really interesting that you you've kind of come up with kind of the same the same type of kind of intervention to some of the things that 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 we're doing and so Carol what does success look like for you in the d &I space of, of media and marketing and how do you track progress how do you hold yourself to account yeah I mean just as DEI is a journey I'd say our tracking process is a journey um, we certainly do have some quantifiable goals in terms of agency representation, behind the camera representation and media. Um, but then when we think about representation in creative, we're still working through that process. Um, we are constantly checking ourselves and course correcting as needed to make sure that we're re representing. But when you think about success, I mean, there is no endpoint to DEI. But if I could work myself out of a job in the next two years, because DEI goes from being an initiative within Walmart marketing to being a mindset among every single uh, associate on the marketing team, I mean, that would be golden. Um, and we do that uh, by bringing up DEI in leadership discussions, in every brief discussion, um, adding training. And so Chris will attest there's so much training related to DEI. You can't make it to all of it, but you know, if you make it to half of it, um, you'll learn something and we're all learning as we go. Um, so eventually, um, I, I'd like to say there would be some endpoint, but we know there never will be. We're constantly learning on this journey together. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think what we've spoken about today in terms of DEI really being a business imperative, as Carissa was saying, in terms of affecting you know, people and in in communities. And then also that business transformation internally, Carol, everything that you're talking around, around goal setting and the uh, creative review board and all of those good things. One of the, one of the areas I'd love to pick up on actually, uh, Carol, was what you were saying was kind of, you've got your day job and then you've got, this is beyond the day job, right? And, and I think, you know, I'm hoping the audience who, who've tuned in today can hear that passion in both of your voices. You know, all three of us have been doing a lot when it comes to our business and, and outside of the business. And I'd like to ask the both of you, 
um, what else do you do outside of outside of work to advocate for DEI, and why is it important to you personally to be active in that space? So, so Chris, can we can we ask of you that question? Sure, and I think it's a great question that we could always all do more. Um, example of you know when Carol asked me, could I do this? I was like. Yes, I mean, I didn't equivocate, I would do it. And then, you know, work interfered of I needed to go to Chicago, which is why I'm in this hotel room. And but I made sure I arranged my travel so that I could still be on and do this. And it's a little thing, but I think, again, it goes to mindset. So I also mentor and I'm a member of our Latinx um, officer caucus at Walmart, as well as our resource group, and really keep an eye out for how do I help um, the Latinos and Hispanics in Walmart have the best career possible. And a lot of that is just bringing, you know, visibility to the great talent that we have. But Walmart, like so many organizations, all organizations is about relationship. And so how am I using relationships to try to make sure that people of color have the visibility and the career opportunities um, that they're seeking, right? And that, that and I'm a promoter of that. I also mentor and have a mentoring circle with another um, Latina in, in merchandising in Walmart and bringing up that next generation of helping to position them. And you know those opportunities to learn from people who have been perhaps a, a little bit more successful or just further on the journey, right? And reaching back and saying, how do you teach someone how to give a presentation when you're presenting to officers or leadership, right? How do you help them network to get known to be up for that next promotion or up for that special project? So I think all of those, that takes time, right? It has to be a, a mental thing of I'm gonna do this. And then last, but certainly not least for me, of I remember being that little Latina girl in Idaho in a small town where you know my high school guidance counselor, you had to fill out this form and have this one-on-one -on -one and where you wanted, we were gonna to apply to, to college. And so I had Stanford, UC Berkeley and Claremont McKenna. And he looked at me and said, well, you know, I don't understand why you're not applying to the community college down in Twin Falls. It's a perfectly good school. And I just looked at him and said, Mr. Olson, with all due respect, I wanna to go to a top law school. And if I wanna to go to a top law school, then I need to go to a top university. And that's why I'm applying to these. Like that was his vision for me. That's all he could think about. And so I give back a lot to the local high school in my small town and any time I have a chance to help with young kids because math is so important, for example. Well, math is something that women underrepresent, but they don't know when you're in grammar school, when you're in middle school, when you're in high school, when it starts to get tough, a lot of cases, there was no one to tell me, like the reason why you need to keep doing algebra is because if you want to do X, Y, and Z in the future, you need that math base. And so I want to be that voice in these kids' lives to say, hey, keep up with math. I know you don't get its practical application now, but guess what? If you want to be an architect, if you want to be an engineer, if you want to be a programmer, if you want to do any of these things, math is the basis to that. And so stick with it because there's not in a lot of cases anyone else in their life that's going to give them that message. That's going to tell them to inspire them to keep going in these important baseline things that create that springboard for opportunity um, later on in life. And so that's how I, I personally choose to do it and what my personal passions are. But I think we all need to find our own paths of how do we help inspire, give back, reach back, and, and give someone a chance to, to get to that next level. I can really relate to that, um, Carissa, like really relate to that in the sense of, you know, thinking back to your younger self and what you could have, you know, what you, the help that you could have got and the support and the inspiration and the nudge towards being a little bit more ambitious and pushing yourself a little bit more. And, and um, it's not my place to say thank you, but thank you for doing that. And anyone that's on this call that feels, you know, that, that they might want to do that, please lean in and, and don't wait for it to happen. Just reach out to to people within your own organization, business network that, that you feel could do with some of your wisdom, some of your experience. I think it's so important to, to share that and to be really authentic and, and transparent with that experience. And to, as everything you were saying, Carissa, you know, to, people have to see it to be it, right? And, um, and I, I do feel as leaders that sometimes we, we have to take ownership and responsibility uh, for doing that. Uh, Carol, I'd love to hear a, a bit about you and kind of what you do in, in your spare time, if you have any, and, and, and some of the roles that you're playing in DNI outside of the Walmart space. Yeah, sure. And I totally agree. I love the power of networking. Uh, I've benefited so much from it and can encourage others to as well. Um, 
sort of related to Carissa and the investment in the youth, um, I'd say my most important on the side job is uh, raising my two daughters to be kind, uh, open, you know, caring kids and uh, hopefully adults um, who do treat everyone with respect. And so I do a lot of cultural learning so that, you know, we do live in Benville, Arkansas, not as much diversity as I would like, um, but we can expose our kids through books and movies and um, very intentional activities. So I do a lot of that for sure. Um, I am also an executive co-chair of Network of Executive Women in Northwest Arkansas. We have about 1,400 members, but our mission is um, to get equality in the workplace, um, gender equality specifically, uh, for all women. So we tie into groups like Latinx um, and um, other organizations to ensure we are driving equality for all women. Um, so I love doing that. I'm also on the um, Diversity and Inclusion Council for the city of Bentonville. Um, we would love for Bentonville to be the most welcoming place on earth. Um, we've got some work to do, but um, we are making progress there. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but I do think that time investment you referenced is really the most important. Um, you know, I'll never turn down a connect re related to DEI. We can always learn something from each other. And so I find myself doing that on a very regular basis um, across the industry. That's phenomenal, Kyle. And I'd like to, um, you, you mentioned kind of gender equality, which I think is super interesting. In your kind of, across the span of your career, have you started to see an increase of women in the industry, especially at higher levels? Are you starting to see that impact? I have. I mean, I do think there's still a lot of room for growth at those higher levels. Um, you know, across the industry, it feels like we're doing a great job bringing in the talent. Um, and then we've got awesome leaders like Carissa at the top levels. Um, I think that, and I think it's not just about gender, but diversity in general, um, we need to be really intentional about developing the talent all the way through the um, career life cycle, if you will. And uh, Walmart's doing some really neat things in that space uh, from a marketing perspective, like investing in Ad Fellows, Verizon's program to build a diverse talent pipeline, um, as well as Brand Lab and, and many others. Uh, but there's always so much more we can do, for sure. Krista, do you have thoughts on that one? I do, and I think it's an especially pivotal time right now across corporate America and America in general, because women were particularly hard hit by COVID, right? And the loss of women in the workforce um, at all levels, I think, is a problem for all of us to deal with. But I think it also highlights the perennial problem that's always been there, of women as caregivers, women as um, in that role, that what we sacrifice in order to step into those roles or to do those roles often is career. And this is a problem that predates COVID, obviously. But I think that corporate America in general has figured out a way to solve that in ways that don't um, negatively impact whoever's choosing to step out to be a caregiver, whether it's a man or a woman. Um, in ways that actually work for us as a society, right? That don't have that cost on the career side. Um, but I think it's a meaty question that maybe his time has finally come for everyone to really engage in as we talk about going back to work and we talk about going back to the office, if you will, what does that look like? What does flexibility actually look like and mean? And how do companies organize the work and challenge some of those status quos of, you know, in the Women's Officer Caucus at Walmart, we've been having listening sessions and a lot, most women, regardless of sort of where they are geographically in, in Walmart's workforce, et cetera, we talk about as modern ways of working of like, COVID has taught us that you don't have to be in the office to be effective. You don't have to be in the office. In fact, you can be more efficient and effective working at home through Zoom. And don't get me wrong, there's all the negatives of Zoom life that we all can do. But I think it's an opportunity perhaps that we haven't had before to redefine ways of working in the modern world, right? That aren't tied or as, as tied to physical based place and don't put a premium on that FaceTime of being in the office, which so often then conflicts with, I've got kids, I've got elders, I've got you know all these activities and how do we as a, a company, how do we as a society wanna organize that work in better ways that serve everyone? I don't think it, it's predominantly been a woman's issue, if you will, but I don't think it is. I think it's a societal issue that we have an opportunity to try some new things out because we've learned through COVID that you can do it differently. 
I completely agree. I, I love everything that you're saying around, you know, this is a societal issue. It isn't just an issue for women. It's it, the, the symptoms and the impact is impacting women. But actually, when we talk about gender equality, we should be talking about inclusivity and how everyone benefits from, from gender equality. I think that's super important. Ladies, I could honestly speak to you all day. I'd like to thank both of you. I, I realize that we've we've kind of hit timing. I'd like to thank both of you for spending this time with me today. Um, Carissa, thank you for giving us a, a bit of a tour of your hotel room. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Whoever asked the question, it's a Spring Hill Suites by Marriott. It just looks spacious, I promise you. <laughs> I think there was actually a question that was asking. I saw it. Um, it honestly, it really is beyond impressive that you are championing de and I transformation, not only within your business, but outside of that too. Thank you for all your additional efforts um, that go beyond just just the day job um, I really hope that we're able to speak again soon because I can't wait to hear what will happen in over the next chapter um, uh, brand innovators team I'd love to know whether I could take some some quick questions uh, uh, from the floor yes okay awesome <laughs> okay so I'll just grab a, a couple of them one of which um, I actually wanted to ask myself is how do you define purpose-driven marketing and how are you bringing it to life? One of the things that we talk about and I'm really passionate about is, is how do we bring purpose into commerce? And, and we're seeing more and more consumers really make their, their decisions about purchasing um, through their values and, and through, um, through the, the, the purpose of brands. Um, either of you, do you want to comment on that particularly? Carol, you wanna go first? <laughs> um, it makes me think of a conversation we had just earlier this week. Um, totally agree. Purpose driven or purpose based decision, the consumer decisions are, you know, more and more important. And so we have to kind of think about those tied back to our live better mission um, on an everyday basis. And so when we do showcase diversity in our advertising, um, when we talk about some of the great things Carissa had mentioned that maybe we haven't given enough visibility to, um, while they are great for sales, they also actually help consumers make good decisions for their family. And so um, the combination of both is certainly the direction we're heading and it doesn't just benefit Walmart, but it, it benefits our consumers. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, you know, so much opportunity in that space, Debbie, and so much innovation. So it's public now, so I can talk about it openly, but Mrs. Obama has a program that she launched on Netflix called Waffles and Mochi. And it's essentially, you know, the Sesame Street of food. But the purpose underneath it is to try to encourage families with young kids to cook more at home and to cook healthy meals. And it's done through a very entertaining format. So they approached us last year to say, can we partner with you? Because part of this is not just inspiring them through the show, but also providing access to affordable, um, healthy foods that families can eat across America. And so, of course, we jumped at the opportunity to partner with them. And we just launched it. Um, at the beginning of May. And it's a multi-faceted campaign. So there's a digital experience with waffles and mochi that we built out, which then through those recipes, you can put that into your cart and shop at Walmart. But the reason why they came to Walmart, right, is because of that part of the work that we do on save money is that families, actually working families can afford to buy that fresh produce at Walmart. They can afford to make those rather than it being something that's just out of reach. And so I look at that campaign and there's also an aspect of Roundup and the cash registers all of the month of May, where you can choose to make a donation to the Pass the Love campaign. And that last part of it, the Pass the Love campaign is actually providing that same experience through food banks across America. So no matter where you are in the socioeconomic spectrum, you can participate in this movement to eat healthier and have a healthier lifestyle. And I just think that's the opportunity. It's good for commerce, it's good for the country, it's good for families. Um, it's good for the planet, and it doesn't have to be one or the other. You can put it all together into something that's also fun and exciting just for kids to watch and participate in and cook, right? So Waffles and Mochi, check it out on Netflix <laughs> for fun. I am so checking that out. It sounds amazing. It sounds really awesome. And actually, Carissa, I love that because that for me is the real definition of inclusion, right? It isn't just that we can we can watch the same programs together, but we can all act off the back of that content and be connected to products and services that are right for me. And to your point, right for my socioeconomic, you know, status. And, and 
honestly, I, that is definitely, I'm going to call my son and that's definitely going to be on, on our watch list, I think. Um, one of the questions I'd love to ask you, Carol, uh, from the floor is what's the biggest internal challenge to achieving DEI initiatives? I, we want to do so much. There's just not enough time and resources. Uh, as an example, you know, in any one spot, we can only show so many uh, customers or associates. And we want to do it all. We want everyone to feel truly seen in our work, um, feel connected to the brand. And sometimes that means seeing themselves in the work. And so there's just not enough time or space to do it all. And so we think a lot about intersectional um, diversity as well um, to help improve that. But that will be something we're constantly chasing. Fortunately, we're in a position where we have very, very, very strong DEI support at Walmart. Um, from a corporate perspective, but also within marketing. And so um, that, I mean, that lays a nice foundation. And then it's just, is there enough time in the day to do, you know, everything we want to do? <laughs> I can, I can really relate to that, uh, Carol. Absolutely. You know, there are so many things that we'd like to get involved in that we'd like to do. There isn't just enough hours in the day. And, and sometimes you have to, you have to assess the impact that you'll have through some of those initiatives and programs and everything both of you were saying around how can we reach more people more authentically in a, in a much more kind of connected and, and personalized way is, is really what we should all be aiming for. Um, again, I'd like to thank you both. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you uh, today. Thank you to everybody that's tuned in. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the session just as much as I have. Really look forward to connecting both with you again very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning into that amazing 